You know, we know that there is no one like our God. There's no one greater than our God. We sit back and I can think of everything that God has given and done for me. I mean, we know the truth, right? I know the truth that God loved me, that God loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son into the world who lived a perfect life, who offered his life as a sacrifice upon the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. And the third day he rose again from the dead and he lives. And because he lives, we know that we also shall live, that everything God promised is true. Promised like we're loved, we're forgiven. We have the hope and the assurance of everlasting life. And yet this morning, I want to share with you something that I struggle with, all right? And so this morning, it's, a, um, it's going to be one of those sermons. I've been up since way early in the morning. I've probably got about two pots of coffee in me right now, all right? So I'm wired. I, I've got some energy. I'm charged up. And I want to share with you something that, if I'm to be completely and totally transparent, this is something that I actually struggle with. That I'd venture to say many of us struggle here this morning. And I'm going to call my shots right off the bat. I'm going to step on some toes, all right? And uh, can you handle the truth? Can you handle the truth? I see a couple of you nodding your head. Some of you not so sure about it. All right. Because I want to remind us, along with Peter and along with Paul, that this world is not your home. This world is not your home, so don't make yourself cozy in it. St. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this is not our home. We are only passing through. We're here for 80, 90, 95 years or so, and then we go to that dwelling place, that place of permanence in which God created for us, as Matthew tells us, before time began. But over the last couple of months, we've been stuck in our houses, haven't we? I mean, I don't know about you, but you, know, you, you feel a little bit less mobile today. You might feel a little bit stir-crazy. You've got some pent-up energy. You've got some pent-up frustration. And I don't know about you, but it's easy for us to go on the computer. It's easy for us to open it up and start surfing the web and to land on Amazon. And if you got, you know, Prime, you, all you got to do is press that Buy Now button. I mean, you don't even have to fill anything out. Just press the Buy Now button, and 24 hours or so, there it is. Whatever it is that you just had to have. Well, as I reflect upon my life, you know, I have this tendency to accumulate an awful lot of stuff. Anybody else out there with me? I mean, we accumulate an awful lot of stuff. But some of the things that I accumulate as well, I mean, I, I uh, accumulate distractions, disappointments, discontentment. I can accumulate depression and hurts and stress and debt. In 1 Peter it says, Beloved, that's us. I urge you as sojourners and exiles. In other words, we don't belong here. We don't live here. This is not our home. We're just passing through. I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And that wage war, it sends an army against our soul. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to challenge you to let go. And I hope this sermon series, it really kind of impacts you, that you take it home. We're going to challenge you to let go of distractions. We're going to challenge you to let go of bitterness, of control, of failure. And today I'm going to challenge you to let go of stuff. See, here is the, the, the principal thought for the morning. It is better to have less of what does not matter and more of what does matter. It's better to have less of what does not matter and more of what does matter. The problem is our culture screams just the opposite. Our culture screams that the more you have, the better off you are. And it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, to the creation story. Adam and Eve, they were walking through the garden. They knew God perfectly. They walked and they talked with God. They knew God's will. God gave them everything in the garden for their enjoyment. Except for God said, stay away from the tree in the middle of the garden. Don't touch it, don't look at it, don't eat from it, just stay away from the tree in the middle of the garden. The serpent comes up to Adam and Eve, and he said, did God really say? I mean, did God really say you can have everything, but just stay away from the tree in the middle? I mean, did God really say? And you see, that's the very first lie. And that same lie is being perpetuated today. And we believe it. I mean, after, you look at all the blessings that God bestows upon us every day. 
You look at all the goodness and everything that God has given us, and we think to ourselves, yes, but what you don't have is what you need in order to be happy. Out of all the blessings that God bestows upon me, yes, God is good, but you know what? It's that one thing over there that I don't have. And if only I could have it, then I would be fulfilled. Then I would be happy. Then I would have purpose. Then my life would be complete. And we buy into that lie hook, line, and sinker. In our culture, more is always better. More money is better. How much money is enough? Just a little bit more. A newer, faster, lower car is better. More vacation is better. A bigger house is better. More is always better. Now, I, I go grocery shopping with my wife, and we'll walk into the local Publix grocery store, and I love it. I love it when I see BOGO. Okay, I mean, I do. I love it. I get all excited when I see BOGO. Buy one, get one, right? And I get extremely excited when I see BOGO on ice cream or on Little Debbie snack cakes. Okay, because I've got one serious sweet tooth. Okay, when I see BOGO, it's like, oh, I'm going to go get myself some. All right, and it, I mean, a, a glorious day is when it's Little Debbie's and ice cream have both got BOGO. But you know the problem is, yeah, I'll buy both of them, and I'll take them home, and I will eat both of them. I'm one of those, like if I have ice cream in the house, I will eat ice cream all day and all night long until it makes me sick. I mean, I will physically have a stomach ache because I will eat so much ice cream or so many sweets. Uh, Solomon, remember King Solomon, the wisest man on earth? Solomon, in all of his wisdom, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And the book of Ecclesiastes, in the Hebrew, the title is Koeleth, and it simply means teacher. So the teacher, Solomon, in all of his wisdom, is going to teach us something from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6. Better is what Solomon says. Better is one handful with tranquility. Better is one handful with peace. Better is one handful with joy than two handfuls with a toil and a chasing after the wind. Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. What Solomon is teaching us is a proper balance in life. Okay, if you go to Proverbs chapter 30, the author says, God, just give me enough daily bread. Just give me enough. Don't give me an overabundance because if I have too much, I might think to myself, I don't need you and walk away from you. And, and God, don't give me too little because if I have too little, well, then I might do something that's going to shame your name. Give me just enough daily bread. And St. Paul in Philippians chapter 4 talks about being content. He said, I have learned the secret of being in, in content, whether in plenty or in want. Whether well-fed or hungry, I have learned the secret of being content. You see, I think what God's word is teaching us here is less of what does not matter and more of what does matter. Because, my friends, because of, of your life in Jesus, okay, your life in Jesus is too valuable. Your calling is too great. Our God is too good for us to be focused on stuff that does not add up to a hill of beans. To be focused on stuff that does not matter. It was in Luke chapter 12 that Jesus says this. He says, watch out. Be on your guard. I don't know, when I hear that, I mean the intensity of that warning, it just causes me to pause. The intensity of that warning just causes you to stand up and to pay attention, to look around. And we automatically think of physical danger, don't we? Watch out, be on guard, like something around the corner is just lurking, waiting to jump out at you. But look what Jesus says. He says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. See, my friends, what God's word is saying is my life does not consist of stuff. My life does not consist of stuff. I am not what I have. I am not what I own. I am not what I wear. I am not what I drive. And I know some of you are out there sitting, yeah, 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 yeah. We've heard this before. We know this. But the sad truth is we don't live it. We do not live it. As followers of Christ who know what he's given and done for us, we don't live it. We still buy into this lie like I need more. And so what if? 
I mean, what if the stuff that you have is robbing you of the life that you want? What if the stuff that you have is robbing you from having that, that deep personal relationship with Jesus? The only person who can fill that void in you. The only person that can give you peace. The only person that can give you joy. The only person that can give you eternal life. What if your stuff is robbing you from the life that you want in Jesus? And so this morning, I want to come at this very practically, okay? I want to talk to you about one-handed living, right? Because better is one handful with tranquility than two with toil and chasing after the wind. So here's some very practical things that you can begin to employ today. One-handed living. One, throw out. Throw some stuff out. Life does not consist in an abundance of your possessions. I mean, how many of you can walk through your neighborhood... Okay, and somebody's got their garage open, and this is what their garage looks like. Okay, I mean, you know it. Yeah, I just saw one yesterday walking through my neighborhood. You know, some of them, they have this very narrow walkway going right down the middle of all that stuff so they can get to the garage door. I mean, you can't even walk through it straight. You've got to go sideways in order to get to, to your garage door. We've got so much stuff that it's accumulating in our garage, and we don't even know what we have. I mean, be honest, how many of you have clothing in your closet and it still has a tag on it? I do. I went to Macy's and bought some shirts about a year or two years ago, okay, and there was those shirts that were made for like the super skinny guys or so, and I'm not super skinny or so, but I bought these shirts because they were a good deal. I have never worn them. They're sitting in my closet this morning. I'll maintain we need to throw stuff out as if your life depends on it. And my friends, for some of us, it does depend on it. I'm not just talking about decluttering. I'm talking about de-owning. Owning less is way better than organizing more. We have so much stuff. Jesus was talking to a rich young ruler in the book of Matthew, chapter 19. This young ruler comes up to Jesus and says, Rabbi, or good teacher, what must I do to be saved? See, he was looking to do something. It was works righteousness all the way. He thought that he could continue to just live his life the way he's living it. If only he could do something, then he would earn God's favor. Jesus responds to this young rich ruler, unlike anyone else he responded to. He said, sell everything. Sell everything you've got. Take the proceeds. Give it to the poor. Follow me, and you will have treasures in heaven. In other words, what Jesus was telling this young rich man was let go of what does not matter and grab more of what does matter. Less of what does not matter, more of what does matter. The scripture goes on to say, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not wrong to have things. It is not wrong to be wealthy. It is not wrong for you to have a, a summer home or to have two different summer homes and to drive nice cars. It is not wrong for you to have stuff. It's wrong when stuff has you. You see, there's a difference there. It's wrong when things have you. My friends, if what you have distracts you from what matters, throw it out. Throw it out. I just moved a couple of months ago, and already in my condo that I'm living in, I've already got a junk drawer. I mean, you guys, you've all got the junk drawers, right? You open up that junk drawer, and it's just full of junk, right? We got all of these knickknacks. We keep these dishes. We keep VHS tapes. How many of us even have a VHS tape player? Okay, we keep VS, uh, VHS tape. If you got a pair of pants that MC Hammer wore, throw them out. They are not going to come back into fashion. And yet we keep all of this stuff. You know that if you drive around Pinellas County, I stand amazed at all the self-storage places that are going up. It seems like there's one of these massive buildings going up on every corner. It's a $39 billion business a year of people storing their stuff in storage units. I, I sit back and I think of American Pickers. It's a hit show on History Channel. They travel all around the country going into people's homes and they just fish through all of this junk that these people accumulated over the years, just looking to buy something, and everyone's afraid to sell it to them. 
They've hoarded stuff for years and years and years, and yet they're still afraid to let it go. Or what about storage wars? Remember that? I mean, people would rent storage units. They would stop making their payments on the storage units, and then all of a sudden, these people would come in, they would auction the storage unit off, and they got to keep or sell whatever was on the inside. Or let me ask you this. Don't show of hands. Okay, no, no hands on this. How many of you still own Cabbage Patch dolls? Remember these things? Or the Beanie Babies? Okay, I mean, I remember people fighting over these. I mean, there was downright riots in the local Walmart store. Everybody trying to get hold of a Cabbage Patch doll. And now you can buy them 20 for a dollar at any garage sale that's out there. I think there's two main reasons why we don't let stuff go. Why we hold on to stuff. One is fear. I might need it someday. I mean, I worked hard for it. What happens if I need it? What if my kids want it? And I think the other one is sediment. You know, somebody gave it to me, you know, or whatever it was. I, I, I go, I think, you know what we can do? I think with all the stuff that we have, we can bless others now. With what that is, we can bless others now with our stuff, and we can trust God, that God would be my provider if I need it down the line. I want to challenge you. If you have not used something in the last year, move it out of the closet. If you have not worn it in the last year, give it away to somebody who is in need. Use it. You've been blessed. Use it to bless someone else. Focus on what matters. Don't let stuff crowd out what matters the most. All right, so one, throw out. Here's number two. Buy less. Buy less. Okay, do you know this last quarter was a record-setting quarter for Amazon? Okay, two-thirds of people, two-thirds of people re uh, admit to shopping to cheer themselves up. They buy stuff to make them feel better, called retail therapy. 28% of people, they shop as a form of celebration. It's like, yeah, I got up and went to work today. I'm going to buy something to celebrate. Okay? We buy stuff. We accumulate stuff for all sorts of different reasons. We do it to escape. We want to escape our circumstances. We do it for entertainment. We go to the mall just to, to entertain ourselves. We want something that's new and clean. It makes us feel powerful. It gives us a, a moment of uh, momentary significance. It was just a good deal. How could I pass it up? It was just a good deal. We buy all this kind of stuff. Okay, we buy something that you didn't need with money that you don't have to impress people that you don't even like. And I know people all over the place who are feeling the pressure of financial stress. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, incline my heart to your testimonies. God, draw me near to your word. Incline my heart. Help me to seek your truth and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. See, I'll maintain the reason that we accumulate stuff is we've got this void. There's this emptiness inside. And we try to fill that emptiness. We try to give ourselves purpose by accumulating stuff. And my friends, it will never work. And I'm not here yet, but when life is so full in Jesus and the goodness of God, we're not going to use stuff to fill the void. We're not going to use stuff to define who we are. Look at me because look what I'm driving. We're defined by what Jesus says about you. And so here's some practical counsel, some practical advice. Families, okay, I try to do this in my family. I want you to think, be honest with yourself right now. What are some of your favorite memories? What are some of your favorite, whether it be childhood memories or just what are some of your favorite memories? I would venture to say it is not when you got a new pair of Lululemon leggings. For the kids, I would venture to say it's not when they got a new Game Boy. I think some of our favorite memories are when we're spending time with the people that we love. Our favorite memories are when we're using God's gifts to serve others, to make a difference in someone else's life. My, my advice to you is this. Choose experience over things. Because when you choose experience over things, you know what? You're going to experience this freedom, this joy, this, this time to allow relationships to develop and become stronger. Throw stuff out. Buy less. And here's the last one. Give more. Give more. I love Paul writing to Timothy. In 1 Timothy, Paul says this. As for the rich in this present age, and I'm just going to stop right there for a second. Because all of us think, I know somebody who's rich. 
I mean, I do. I know somebody who's rich. I bet you can automatically it comes to mind somebody who's rich, right? You think, oh, yeah, they've got two houses, and they can buy whatever car they want to buy. They go out to dinner all the time. They, they're, they're rich. You know, their kids, their kids are in college. Their kids don't want for anything. Whatever they need, they get it. But that's the way I think. You know, I don't think that I'm rich. But Paul writes, as for those, as for the rich in this present age. Now, my friends, he's talking to us. If you drove a car to church this morning, you're in the top 18% of the world's population. You're rich. If you can eat three meals today, and you're not really worried about where your food is going to come from this afternoon, you're rich. If you have a home, shelter over your head, and the environment is air-conditioned, you're rich. If you had to choose which pair of shoes to put on this morning, which shirt to wear, you're rich. If you can order a pizza off of your cell phone, you are rich. And so Paul is talking to us. I want this to soak in. I want you to fully think about this and, and fully understand what Paul is saying. He says, as for the rich in this present age, us, charge them not to be haughty. In other words, don't be arrogant. Don't be prideful. Nor to set their hopes or to set their trust on the uncertainty of riches. Paul is saying, don't put your trust in your wealth. But put your trust on God. Put your trust on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Our God is good. Our God has blessed us over and over and over again. And then look what Paul says. He goes, they are to the rich. Okay, look what he does not say. Paul does not say they're to go out and buy more. Paul does not say they're to go out and hoard it all. They're to go hit the buy now button on Amazon and then go out and rent a storage space to store all of our belongings. Paul says that they are to do good. My friends, we are called to do good. To be rich in good works. To be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of that which is truly life. See, when we use what God has blessed us with, when we look to his goodness, when we look to him and what he's given and done for us, that's life. Life in the present and life to come. I had my buddy Bob Van Hoos, who's with the Lord right now from Kentucky. Bob would say, honey, he want, when he'd say, honey, you need to adjust your wanter. So you need to adjust your wanter. Did you get that? Okay, wanter, yes, your wanter. And then the second one he would say is, you can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. My friends, we need to focus less on what does not matter and more on what does. L let me ask you another quick question here. Okay, be honest with yourself. Because like, when I think back, I have no emotional getting or keeping stories. Here's what I mean by that. I don't have any emotional stories where I got that new bed. Oh, I just, I love this new bed. Oh, this is so great, God. I feel so close to you. Oh, God, my relationship with you is complete. I've got no getting stories like that. Oh, I got my new iPhone 11. This is wonderful. God, my relationship with you is so good. I've got no keeping stories. A, a keeping story is when you have something, like you've got that refrigerator, and you bought a new refrigerator, so you put the old one in, in the garage. You know, you could have given it to the single mom who needed help, but you didn't. You kept it in the garage. I've got no keeping stories like that, but I do have emotional giving stories. When you went out on a limb and you gave that tithe, or you went out on a limb and, and you gave away the, 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 your bonus at work, or you gave away the $1,200 that the government gave you, or you went out and you bought a bunch of gift cards and, and you're giving them to, to single families or single moms in need. I mean, I've got all kinds of giving stories where you gave and, and all of a sudden you made a difference in the life of someone. My friends, remember, this world is not your home, so don't get cozy in it. But let me challenge you with this. Are you accumulating on earth what you cannot keep? Or are you investing in heaven what you cannot lose? Throw away Buy less, give more, and when we do, we're going to experience a freedom, 
a love, a joy, a peace. Things in this world don't last. Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. Just one last thought. Why is one handful better? Why is one handful better? Because you know why? The other hand is free. The other hand is free to live love. The other hand is free to serve. You can help someone up. You can pat someone on the back and give a word of encouragement. You can offer praises to God. I mean, it's a radically better way to live. My friends, never let the stuff keep you from living the life that you want, the life that we have in Jesus. See, I, I think one of the reasons that we always want more stuff is because we're sinful, right? And we're always trying to fill that void. And we think that if I could only get that, if I could only accomplish it, then that void will be filled. It never fills. The only way we fill that void is because of what Christ has done for us. He forgave us our sin. As Pastor Fudge says, he remembers our sin no more. It's been washed away. We're forgiven. We have life, everlasting life. And God looks at us and he says, you are my child and I love you. That's what gives us worth. That's what fills that void. Here's my challenge. This upcoming month, we're going to do a share -thon. Now, if you've never experienced it before, a share -thon is we have a massive garage sale, but we just simply give it all away. We don't charge anybody for anything. We'll, pe we'll put it out throughout the, throughout the area. If someone is in need, they can simply take it. So I want to challenge you, go through your closets. Go through your garages. Go through your attics. Save yourself a couple hundred bucks and close out the, the you store it place. Give the stuff away. Give it away to someone in need and make a difference in their life. We are so blessed. Our God is so good. So let's let go of the stuff and focus on what really matters.